wouldn't be cotton for me. So I'm going to start off with a little drama here. So, um, so Art. Yes. W- welcome to our, our five-star analytics drop. So I start you off with our theory of constraints, coffee on a scrum Thursday. Mm. Yes. Oh, <coughs> delicious. Very, very good. But would you prefer the mild or the bold empirical methodology? I think definitely bold. Bold. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. Very, very good. Okay. Hey, Joe! We need a scrum bun burger, a, a heavy on the feedback sauce, okay? On table five over here. So, what did I just do there? <laughs> Uh, was was this in context for a five star restaurant? Was 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 yelling back to the kitchen for the Joe with the cigarette hanging out of his mouth that cooked the the, the meal in context for a five star restaurant? Yeah. But would that have been in context for a diner? Well, forget about the cigarette. But would that have been in context <laughs> for a diner? Yes. So, which is the best practice? Both. Right, right. It depends on the context. And, and, and so, so uh, context is what matters. And so we're going to carry that theme throughout this talk. But you've met my two alter egos. Let me tell you a little bit about myself first. So my name is Larry Maccheroni. I graduated from Virginia Tech with a double E degree. Any Hokies there? Oh, come on. No Hokies. If I still have season tickets, I go back for every, every home game. But while I, was, while I was an undergrad at Virginia Tech, I started my own business. Uh, factory floor automation. We actually landed a big contract with GE to, GE to do turbine control. And turbines are pretty, uh, these are power generation turbines. They're hooked up to the power grid. And there's huge magnetic forces acting on these things. If you tell them to do the wrong thing at the wrong moment in time, they literally blow up, destroy millions of dollars worth of equipment, and kill people. So <laughs> we got good at the intersection of software development and quality and safety. And I went on, you know, published on that. We became the first ISO 9000 certified software company in in the state of Virginia. So so we became pretty well known for this sort of high quality software. Um, I got invited to a few panels to talk at Carnegie Mellon University. Ended up getting an offer um, to go run a research consortium out of Carnegie Mellon University. So I uh, sold out my interest in, in, in my business uh, right before the dot-bomb crash, which was nice. And, um, but don't, don't cheer for me too loudly because I, I was crazy and I reinvested all of it and even borrowed some money because I was an expert in investing in technology, right? Because I'd grown this small business to 80 employees and 20 million a year in sales in a few years. And I invested it all in three dot-com businesses that all <laughs> so, so I had to go to get a job at Carnegie Mellon University so I could pay back the loans I had. Um, so while I was at Carnegie Mellon, I, um, I started on a PhD. Um, I, I met a gentleman by the name of Watts Humphrey. Anyone know who Watts Humphrey oh, yeah. is? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Great. Um, so Watts and I started uh, going out and talking about, about uh, uh, software and, and measurement in particular. And, and, and uh, Watts was um, a very different person than I think a lot of people have an impression uh, for him. Because he was the author of the CMM, the Capability Maturity Model, but he was not the author. And as a matter of fact, he was secretly opposed to the capability maturity model integrated, the CMMI. Two and a half. <laughs> Two and a half pages. And the CMMI? Hundreds of pages. So, anyway, anyway. so Watts and I um, started trying to figure out how to do lighter weight, more agile type measurement. And, and, and I gave a talk at the Agile Conference in 2009 on these concepts that we had evolved over five or six years of working together. Um, and the, the talk was so well received that I got three job offers out of that talk. I ended up taking one of those offers and, and going to work for, for Rally Software. Actually, it wasn't one of the original offers. I targeted Rally um, you know, because I, they, they, had the, they didn't even come to my talk, really. So I, I had to say, if I'm going to take a break from my, yeah, if I'm going to take a break from my PhD to go work in the industry, I'm not going to work for just any old people that, that want to hire me. I'm going to go make Rally, ask Rally to hire me. So um, I applied for every job at Rally and, and got a job there. And the reason I wanted to do that is that Rally was the biggest, the biggest name in the industry. They were hosting that conference in 2009. In fact, I think we're the primary hosts of every, conf- at every Agile conference since then, at least. And I don't know how many before that, because I didn't go to any before that. Um, and more important than the fact that they were the 
the dominant player in the industry was that they actually have a multi-tenant SaaS database with all of their customers' data. So I'm a software engineering metrics researcher, <coughs> and I want to crawl around in all of that data. So that's why Rally was the number one choice for me. Um, but it took me a while. I, I ended up with, in the product owner job for the analytics team, but, but it took me a while to convince Rally to trust me to, to, to do that research and for us to work out all the legal and, 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 and security requirements. We finally anonymized the database, copied it over to another database, the data for almost 10,000 teams, literally every transaction of every user in Rally for uh, several years, um, copied it over to another database, and in January of this year, I started crawling around in that database myself and two other programmers. And by April, we had found some really interesting findings. And the motivation for this work was that you're agile coaches, right? You go into people's businesses all day long and you tell them, you should do X or you should do Y. And doing A is better than doing B. But do you really know? Do you really know how much better A is than B? Can you tell them that if you do A, you're going to see a 40% increase in your productivity or you're going to see a, a doubling of your quality, halving of your defect density? No. And, and it's really hard sometimes to convince management to do these things you're recommending with just your word as consultants. The motivation for this work was to give you numbers so you could plug it into an economic model and you could actually get the resources and get the people motivated to the change that you wanted. So that was the work we did. We published that in, in April, and I was out there putting up my proposals for conferences, the Agile conference being one of them. I said, well, this is, this is like 10 years of my life and all of this research. And I've got to put a proposal into the Agile conference to present this stuff. And oh, by the way, I, I need to do something a little softer. So I'll put together this um, softer skills thing at, uh, uh, Seven Deadly Sins of Agile Management. Yeah, that's a good title. And I didn't really have the content. I whipped up the content in, in a weekend. Guess which talk they picked at the Agile Conference for me to present? The 10 years of my life or the weekend of putting up these slides together? I think you guys know the answer to that. So, so I ended up uh, giving that talk at the Agile Conference. It was, it was very well received this year uh, as well. In fact, it was the number one voted uh, talk at, at the Agile Conference. But, but back to the content. So this is the presentation I gave at the Azure Conference this year. And then I'll follow it up with some of the 10 years of my life stuff if we have time. Um, so anyone recognize this guy? No? Uh, just, just for the hell of it? Flounder. Flounder, who said that? Flounder, Flounder. I don't know, am I right? Yeah, you're right, you're right. It's a flounder. What's the most interesting characteristic of this guy? It's like on both sides of his head. Eyes are on both sides of his head. So, so why is that, why are its eyes on one side of its head? Exactly. So it eyes are for feedback, right? Feedback from the environment. Well, one eye is in the sand. It's not getting any feedback, right? So it moves both eyes to one side to maximize its feedback mechanism. That's that's the nature of, of this guy. I argue that Agile is just another example of evolution of software process. Like all the other ones we've been through before. I've been around long enough to have gone through Spiral and, and Waterfall and Spiral and, and XP and RUP and TSP and PSP and you, you name it. I've been around long enough that I've, I sort of am immune to the buzzword sort of marketing sort of aspect of it. But so I, I don't think of those things as sort of like silver bullets. I think of all process improvements in terms of a change in your feedback mechanism, an optimization of your feedback mechanism, and a change in your values, what you value more than, than others. So there's a gentleman by the name of Mark Kennelly that wrote this book, STLC 3.0. And so this concept of I, I, I'm not the only person to think of this, and he wrote a book on it before me. I think I'm the only person with a glowing recommendation on Amazon for, for this guy. So um, I recommend his book. Go buy it. I think he sold maybe 10 copies, most of them based on my recommendation. But, but it really is a great – you know why he didn't sell any copies? He didn't have a cool title, title like The Seven Deadly Sins. Who wants to buy a book with STLC in the title? So beyond a tacit understanding of Agile. 
is the idea. So, um, but here's the idea. The idea is that we change the feedback mechanism, we change the emphasis of the feedback, we change the period of the feedback, the frequency of the feedback, and the, the, how soon you get it, and we change the values. And, and, and so this is a comparison of sort of heavyweight traditional and the, the new agile one. So in the traditional, you emphasized the process, and you wanted feedback on the process. And that was a function of your context. Remember the five-star waiter and, and Joe? Remember the, the, the flounder? That was a function of your context. So what was the context back then when we developed processes that were process feedback heavy? The context was that compilation was really expensive. You had maybe someone putting manual cards in an order and you had to wait for the compile to come back. Testing was all manual and, and had to be run um, you know, by humans with these long scripts. And delivery of your product was incredibly expensive. If you put it out there and you had to make a change to it, it was incredibly costly to pull it back. You had to you know, you know, go through a whole other release cycle. Well, what has happened since then? Compilation is free. It runs a thousand times. It runs while you type on your computer now. Um, testing is automated. There's no manual scripts, so there are still some, but it's mostly automated. It's much cheaper. And delivery is, you know, web services, right? We, we just push it out, push out a new build several times a day. So the context has changed, and the emphasis has changed. So when, when in that old context, if you had to cross backwards over one of these expensive boundaries, the compilation boundary, the testing boundary, or the release boundary, it was incredibly costly to you. So the most critical feedback you needed was a checklist to make sure that you only crossed forward over those boundaries once. And that checklist was the process. So we needed feedback on those checklists because the better those checklists were, the less often we had to pass backwards over those very expensive boundaries. So that was the context we were in. The context we're in now is that it's free to get this stuff out there. The most critical way of, of the most common way of losing now is if your product fails to meet a market window. It's actually cheaper to put crap out there and quote rework it. Remember, have you guys been around long enough to to to, to have the feeling that the word rework? is like one of the seven deadly sins. <laughs> rework, let's put that up there. Rework, right? You know, it's no longer bad. Rework is no longer bad. Rework is good. Rework means that you've listened to your customers now, and you've actually incorporated that, and you've built a different product. Put crap out there and evolve it really rapidly towards the direction that the customer wants you to go is a much more economical as well as successful way of doing software development now. So feedback on the product became the absolute most critical feedback that you needed. And that's what Agile emphasizes, is feedback on the product. Feedback on the plan was important, because if you ran out of money before your budget ran out, um, if you ran out of money before your project got done, you were, you were, you were done. Now, um, you know, you need a little bit of planning, so we still have a little bit of that. Control for the organization was the value that dominated in the, in the traditional, and collaboration is the, is the value that dominates now. It's, it's all about feedback and values. It's just a shift in the context drove different ones to be more important than they were in the past. So what about all this stuff? Con Scrum and XP and Crystal and Kanban and TDD and daily stand-ups and Agile Manifesto. And what about all those things? Well, they are just prescriptive ways of changing the feedback loops and emphasizing different values. So this has all just been a big setup for another context change that I am arguing is happening right now. Agile was originally designed for small teams. It was in the context of single, single teams that most of these concepts were developed. Well, Forrester and Gartner will tell you now that 60 to 80 percent of all development moving forward is going to be done in an Agile way. These are not small teams anymore. These are large organizations that are doing Agile development. These organizations require quantitative insight. They require metrics to manage their projects. So we have to reintroduce measurement back into the Agile world. But if you do it in a traditional way, if your slide deck, when you introduce it to your, to your organization, starts with one of these two quotes, when you cannot express it in numbers, your knowledge is of a meager and unsatisfactory kind, or if you say, what gets measured gets done, 
you're bound to fail. These are the wrong way to, to introduce it. So what is the right way to introduce it? Well, I'm going to first tell you about specific examples of the wrong way, and then I'm going to give you the heavenly virtues that go with, with those. So that's what this talk is. So, so um, why measure? What are the purposes of measurement? What are the <coughs> values that we get out of, the benefits that we get out of measuring? Predictability. Predictability. So you can forecast. So you can make projections. <coughs> Feedback. Feedback. Excellent. Accountability. Accountability. Tracking. Make sure you're on target. Very good. I think that's most of the ones I have to think about. Mm -hmm. Others? I mean, quantifying, and you can see how what you've done, right? Yeah, making decisions with insight, because those yeah. decisions that are have insight are more likely to be accurate, and you'll have better outcomes with that. So, so these are the these are the the ones you know. Diagnosis is sort of the quantifying part, and feedback and forecasting. We sort of touch on all those. Um, I'm glad nobody been in this group. You all knew better. I sort of set you up a little bit. Mentioned this last one, but a very common assumption is that you you do measurement to drive behavior. Well, if I just measure that thing, then, then we'll drive that behavior. And I argue that this is sin number one. Um, and it's sort of a medicine. It, 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 is, the, it is the number one sin. I, I don't know if anyone's ever heard the phrase. Um, C.S. Lewis said that um, bravery, is bravery up here? Bravery is not up here. Bravery is the form of all virtue at the testing point. Think about it. If you have to be honest, if you have to be diligent, if you have to be kind, if you have to show charity, well, when it's hard to do those things, you need to be brave to get over that. Well, when you think of metrics as levers rather than as feedback mechanisms, that actually is the, is the, is the path to, to, to the dark side of metrics. That's sort of the medicine for all this. And let me give you an example um, that illustrates this. So um, feedback... feedback should be used rather than levers. So feedback, the difference between these is our feedback measures are used to improve your own performance, whereas lever measures are employed to change someone else's behavior. And this is a very subtle difference, and I'll, I'll give you an example to illustrate this. So this is a chart out of one of our competitors' products. This is actually shipping product for this customer, this, this uh, competitor, I should say. And there's a couple things wrong with this chart. I'm going to talk about the second one later. But the one I'm going to focus on right now is the red. So there's a red line there and red dots. Let me explain what this chart is. So this is a scatter chart of stories, cycle time. Cycle time. So along the x-axis is where they finished. Along the y-axis is how many days they took to finish. <clears throat> and so things that are lower on the chart finished quicker. And that's what we want, right? We want, we want things to finish quicker. And um, we don't want them to take a long time. But these people have taken this idea, this, this concept of we want them to finish quicker, and they've taken it too far. They've tried to apply, misapply a technique. Welcome to our five-star restaurant. In a diner. They've misapplied a technique from the manufacturing world of putting a control limit here and labeling everything above the control limit. Red. Knowledge work is different. I would point you to a book called The Black Swan to sort of say that all wonderful inventions, all great art, all discoveries have all been driven by these black swans, these outliers. These red dots that are up here are probably your most valuable work in your company in, in all likelihood. Or maybe not. The point is that drawing the red line and labeling the red dots guarantees you will have fewer of these next time. But why will you have fewer of these next time? What, what did someone say? Right, they'll, they'll, they'll game it, right? Because you're measuring it. They'll say, oh, well, we don't want the red dots. We don't want to be the team with the red dots next time. Let's uh, artificially split the stories up so they don't deliver value. Let's, let's game the system. We don't, want the, we don't want to be the red dots. Well, you know what you've done when you've done that? You've hidden data from yourself. You don't want that. You don't want measurement to hide data from yourself. So what should you do instead? This is an alternative that we've proposed. Um, I actually... Um, two years ago, well, it's all over two years now, it's almost two and a half now, um, at the Lean Kanban Conference, uh, David Anderson invited me to talk at the Lean Kanban Conference, because I had been on the Lean Kanban board essentially telling him, 
you're doing it wrong. You're calculating the control line this long. And they, they first thought that I was just this naive, you know, newbie on the board. And it's like, oh, well, let's explain to you the theory behind the control line. And I was like, I, I a PhD, Carnegie Mellon, I know stats. I, I know this stuff. You're not teaching me anything. And so I, I, the first night that I told them they were doing it wrong, they all jumped on me, tried to help me improve. And, and then I, the next day, I, I recorded these videos that showed examples of how their calculations um, were wrong, literally wrong, um, with the assumption that they, I'll show you the reason why they were wrong. Um, and so David said, okay, well, if you're so smart, come give a talk at the Lean Time Up Conference. And uh, he tweeted at the conference, he, came, he was sitting in the back of the room when I argued that his technique was wrong, and he tweeted that it was the, it was the most interesting talk of the conference for him. So he made me the track chair for the, the quant the metrics track for the next year's Lean Combat Conference. But anyway, so this was, the, this was the, the subject matter of the presentation I gave that first time. Um, it's, a, it's, it's very similar. It's got the same x-axis and y-axis over here. It's got a scatter in here, but there's no red lines. The idea here is this is an interactive chart. You encourage the teams to hover over these and drill down into them and talk about them in a retrospective way. This is knowledge work. We collaborate. We talk. We get feedback from the results of our past work. It's the same metric as the other chart. It's just presented in a way that it gives people feedback so they can improve rather than as a lever to try to drive a specific kind of behavior. That's the difference and that's the medicine, medicine number one. Um, so medicine number two is a lack of balance. So um, this is not uh, necessarily a, a new thing to to agile measurement, so it, it, it uh, but it's really, really important. So I have this sort of mnemonic, do it fast, do it right, do it on time, and keep doing it. And I've got these six sub-dimensions, uh, productivity, responsiveness, quality, customer satisfaction, predictability, employee satisfaction, um, essentially bucketed in there. So there's a seventh dimension that I've added since I had a graphic artist to actually do work for me. So, hint, hint. Ian just started this week as a graphic artist, so he can update this chart. There's a seventh dimension called build the right thing. And I'm not really sure where it actually fits in those quadrants, so I have to figure that out. There you go. But anyway, I would argue that you're better off not having any metrics regime than one that doesn't have at least one metric from each of these four quadrants. You're better off holding back. Because um, what, happens, what happens if you tell your folks, productivity... The, 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 the <laughs> what happens if you tell them the quality goes down? Right. What happens if you tell your folks productivity? That's what we want. Faster, faster, faster. That's all you get. That's all you get. What will go down? Quality will go down. What else? Do it. Keep doing it. Customer employee satisfaction. Customer. So, so you can't just drive one metric. If you drive one metric, you get you get the wrong, wrong, wrong results. So this is the thing we call the software development performance index. It's got these seven dimensions. These four we automatically extract from the Rally tool, or we, 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 we published it in such a way that you could, in theory, extract it from any ALM tool. Um, we have these two that are acquired via lightweight surveys, and we're in the process of adding functionality that will get these um, in the tool, in the, in the Software Development Performance Index tool that we're shipping. I can demo that later if you're interested. Um, and then there's this one that I'm noodling on um, uh, with a... With a, a, a friend of mine, a, a former coworker of mine, uh, Todd Olson, um, actually he's 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 working on this really hard. A build the right thing metric, and we have a couple different ideas on how we might do this. One is in-app analytics that sense how well used are the features that you you actually produce, and then there's another one that involves surveys and, and value as planned and versus value as delivered. Sort of a weighted shortage job first for those of you safe folks in here. All right, did you have a question? So I was like, so we're really struggling with this where I work. Um, and so we want to know kind of what the business value is we're delivering to the customer. So is that, I mean, I sense that's sort of kind of what that is down here. Yeah, so I have, I have the ability to demo a tool that does these four. Yeah. And you can sort of get your head around those two. And we're in the process of building out the rest of the features for that. I'm still noodling on this the right way to do this. So in the past, this has been, this is sort of the holy grail of measurement for, for Agile, right? So I don't have it delivered yet, but I'm working on it. Maybe a year from now, I'll have another talk. That's my talk for next year. So, so I mean, so, what you just said, in-app analytics, that's after you've already built it, you've already spent the money. 
So feedback is usually retrospective. So what will that do for you? That will tell you that the teams that are good at reading the market are the teams that have the highest retrospective um, delivery. That will tell you that the, the types of features, maybe you can identify characteristics of those features that were the most attractive and you can use sort of a Bayesian approach to figuring out what future features might actually um, meet that. There's power in that ability to measure it retrospectively. You then get insight that will allow you to make future decisions better as well. I'm not going to fix that one for you tonight. So. Can you uh, drill in a little bit how you measure responsiveness? Yes, we're going to talk about these four in great detail. And um, yeah, we're going to talk about these four in great detail a little bit later. That's, that's sort of the second part of the talk. I'll finish going through the seven deadly sins, and then I'll introduce you to the, the research that we did using these four. Okay. Um, so not everything that counts can be counted. And um, Agile is values, right? We talked about it being an emphasis, change in feedback and emphasis and a change in, in values, cultural change. And trust is critical to this culture. What happens to trust when you tell folks your knowledge is of a meager and unsatisfactory kind unless you can put numbers on it? They, that says to them, we don't trust you. We only trust the numbers. So if you try to do that in an agile world, if you try to say your knowledge is of a meager and unsatisfactory kind, that says, they hear, we don't trust you. And that's not what we want to do in the Agile world. Um, so sin number three is believing that metrics can replace thinking. Rather, it needs to be a virtuous cycle of qualitative insight that's either confirmed or refuted with numbers, which leads to more qualitative insight. And you get into this, this pattern. You want to complement the people and the thinking with the numbers. You don't want to replace the people and the thinking with the numbers. Um, sin number four is spending too much money on the metrics. So, and this is this is a subtle this is a subtle one because there's it's not just money that's costly. Um, has anyone done the personal software process PSP? Oh, we got one. Oh, we got three of you guys in here. Did you like writing down what you were doing every 15 minutes? Did you like it? How about every eight minutes? Every, no. Every eight minutes. <laughs> Did you like it, Bob? No. Okay, we have no glutton for punishment folks here. <laughs> no, no sadists in here. So, do you know what? The SEI, the Software Engineering Institute, which released this process called the Personal Software Process that requires you to record what you're doing every few minutes, um, they did a study that confirmed that the cost of doing that, that writing it down, was no more than 3%. was closer to 1.5% of, of the total effort. And they got at least 3% or 1.5% value out of it. Well, did you really feel like it was only a 3% or 1.5% burden when you were doing that? No. The perceived burden of that is much bigger than that 1.5% to 3%. So you don't want to piss off your developers, right? They're your most valuable resource. If you make them do this, write the stuff down. So that's why we recommend to do passively acquired measures. All those first four dimensions of the SDPI are acquired from data that you are putting in the tool for other purposes. You're not putting them in the tool for metrics purposes. You're putting them in the tool just to track your work. And then we extract them. It takes Pretty smart heuristics to do that, pretty advanced techniques to do that. We actually explored over 120 metrics to find the four that represent each of those four dimensions most, most accurately. So it was a very, very expensive research that we did to do that. But we did the research expensively to save the people from having to do it manually. Um, so I'm moving on to sin number five here. Um, does anyone know who this guy is? Carmelo Anthony, yes. I'm not a, I'm not a basketball fan, but I'm a stats fan, right? I like numbers. So, so um, I love. And sports is a great place for stats analogies and stats research and stuff. By the way, I don't don't ask me to join your your Final Four, your your March Madness pool. The last one I joined, <laughs> the last one I joined, I put in four entries, and my my three of my entries were number one, number two, and number three. I came away with most of the pot. Um, so they told me never to come back again. But um, <laughs> I used a technique called ELO chess, though, if you want to go look that up, if you ever want to win those things. ELO chess is a, 
is the statistical technique that will get you the answer to that. Um, the, the final four. Um, Wrote that down. Elo chess, yeah. So, uh, well, this guy, is he a good player? Does anyone know? Melon? He's not a shooter, but he's not a shooter. He's, he's not? Okay, yeah, so you, you know where I'm going with this. But he's the third, he's the third highest scorer and the eighth highest scorer in the whole league. Of course he's a great player, right? No. Why not? He shoots, like, how many shots are you Yes. He doesn't play deep. So the reason he's the highest scorer. Well, he's hanging out at the other basket. He's not going to go back and defend his basket because his salary is dependent on this metric highest scorer. There's no, there's no good metric for D, right? This, 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 uh, this metric that drives his salary, the one that we're using to motivate this guy, is highest scorer. That's the one that makes him famous. That's a, so he, when he's in the game. Versus when he's not in the game, when he's out injured or when he's out sick, his team wins more when he's out sick than when he's injured. So the only reason he's the highest scorer is because he takes more shots, which would be okay if he were making more opportunities for shots for his team. That's not the case. He's actually, when he's in the game versus when he's not in the game, the, the team shoots the same number of shots per minute. So when he takes a shot, he has a much lower likelihood of chance of sinking it. He's literally stealing shots from his teammates who have a higher likelihood chance of stealing. And so this leads us to sin number five, using a convenient metric rather than the metric that you should be using. Um, and so we have this, this technique called Odom, this, this mnemonic called Odom. I actually invented this a, a quite a few years ago, seven or eight years ago. Um, it's still sitting up on the right-hand corner of my PhD advisor's dry erase board. I go there every few months and I see it. And it's still written in there. It's the first place where we wrote it down. It's sitting up in the right-hand corner of his dry erase board. It's been there for eight years. Um, um, the idea here is that better measurement or better visualization of your data, let's call it that, leads to a better picture, a better understanding of the reality, insight into the reality of the situation. It tells you where the trees are in the dark. It lights up the pots of gold that might be in your path. So when you have better insight, you make better decisions. Oh, I'm not going to keep walking forward and bump into this tree because I've been, it's been illuminated with measurement or insight and, and insight from that measurement. I'm going to turn right because I can see a glimmer of gold over there that I want to go towards. You make better decisions, and that leads to better outcomes. No broken noses and discoveries of pots of gold. So strategy. Companies spend a ton of time and money on, on development of strategy. And, and some of them are really good, and some of them are not so good. But <coughs> I would argue that the reason they're really good ones fail sometimes, and the not-so-good ones even sometimes work, has very little to do with how good the original strategy is. I think a bigger driver of strategy success is the day-to-day -day decisions that the people on the ground, the people doing the day-to-day -day work are making. And without feedback mechanisms, without measurements that really give them insight to make better decisions to reinforce the strategy, they inadvertently make decisions that work against the strategy. So that's what Odom is for. And it's called Odom instead of Medo because the idea is you have to start with the outcome to have in mind. Carmelo Anthony, we don't care if you're the highest scorer. We want to win games. Talk about the outcome of winning games. Well, what decision does Carmelo need to make in order to decide that? He needs to decide whether he's going to take the shot or he's going to pass to his teammate. So he needs metrics that give him insight as to whether or not this is a good spot on the floor for him to shoot from when he's going up against a guy that th that's this high, that's playing in a forward or a strong forward or a center or a guard position. Oh, good. He, he has a high scoring percentage against guards but not against strong forwards. Mm, it's a strong forward standing in front of him. Pass the ball. Uh, I'll get to you in just a sec. Let me finish it. Insight is, is, is that, that likelihood of of uh, the measurement is sort of the percentage. Good. Yes. So you just said talking about uh, Carmelo um, and talking about this that in order to achieve the different outcome, 
You're going to be making different decisions with your behaviors. Yes. So you're going to have different insights. So therefore, you measure it. Mm -hmm. So you're at, so earlier you had mentioned something about not wanting measurement to change behavior, and I'm thinking that maybe you meant there are certain kinds of differences in how you want to be doing the measurement to change different types of behavior. Well, we actually do want measurement to change behavior, but we want the reason for management to introduce measurement not to be to change behavior. We want it to be the providing of a feedback mechanism so that they can make better decisions on a day-to-day -day basis, so they can improve their own performance. We're basically trusting that people want to do their best. Now, in Carmelo's situation, that might not be the case. But in most software development teams, this is he's measured on his pay. Is his pay is driven by that. So his outcome is making more money, bringing home more money. But the team's outcome is, is, is winning games. So you want to think about the outcome and then what decisions would reinforce that outcome and then what insight would do that. You want, you want the company to think backwards. You want them to start with the outcomes and work your way back. And you introduce metrics like that scatter chart is the same exact metric as the one that I said violated sin number one. It's just it didn't have the red lines and the red dots. I didn't make a judgment about it. I provided it for feedback. People could go hover over those dots and, and get insight as to what was driving those big, big, big things. Maybe some of them were great discoveries and you should leave them alone and not change the future. Maybe some of them were cross-team dependencies, those high up dots on the chart. The ones that I didn't color red, but people would naturally hover over. Maybe they were cross-team dependencies, and maybe they could go work on improving that cross-team dependency. So it's the focus of the improvement. The focus is on the improvement. The focus is not on the driving the behavior directly. Give them the right feedback, and they'll make the right decisions is essentially the, is essentially the idea. It's subtle, but it, it's critical. Good question. So can you repeat that? You said that management needs to introduce the. I don't think I get what you're saying. But management is instead of for the, to change the behavior, management is to introduce the behavior. Or? So management can introduce feedback mechanisms, but not necessarily make judgments about them. Give them as a tool that they can use to, to get feedback on their own, which behaviors lead to the best outcomes so they can make their own better decisions in the future. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. Introduce a, a tip chart instead of a control chart, yeah. a feedback mechanism instead of a judgment mechanism. So, I'm hearing what you're saying. You're saying that management should make the decisions management's going to measure performance some way, one way or another. They're going to decide who to promote, who not promote, blah, 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 blah. Um, that that should be based on the outcomes Bingo. and not necessarily the measurements at that top level. Exactly. And therefore, it's supposed to be based really more on the decisions that people are making and also the context within which they're making decisions. Because sometimes good decisions can be made in bad contexts and they turn out bad anyway. Joe versus the five-star restaurant. Exactly. Um, and so these particular measurements are not ones that are used to measure the performance of the people. They're used to measure things that people can then do, use to then improve their performance. Exactly. Exactly. So the measurements that I've focused on for the SCPI are really outcome measures. They're not the measurements that I'm talking about up at the top there. They're really just sort of the final, you know, feedback the, what you really need is sort of earlier. They're all trailing indicators, the measurements that in the SDPI. You need leading indicators for that. So this question. I'm, I'm kind of missing the second one I mentioned there because at the end, when we're talking about the outcome, you need to measure to measure the outcome somehow as well. Like mm -hmm. team performance, you yeah. measure two things: either the team wins or uh, the player makes more more shots or. More, more points, right? So, to some extent, there is the second level of measurement that kind of plays into that. Uh, I mean, isn't isn't that kind of only putting this the whole level of this this loop between measurement and outcome kind of into a different level? Whether you talk about like company or employee or team and individual and so on. I mean, 
Yeah, so the, the outcome measure winning games is different than the measure of what's the percentage likelihood of me sinking the basket at this point on the floor and with this guy in front of me. The measurement that you want to really feed to your teams of that first kind. And then the, the trailing measures are sort of the ones you want to tell people are, are sort of what the whole company is driving towards. And we give them the ability to connect their behaviors and their decisions with those. those. And I'll give you more examples of this. Hold on. <coughs> I think you'll be a little more satisfied in a little bit. One more, and then I'll move on. So it's basically the measurements you're getting to that top line are the measurements that people can use immediately that they can use to inform their decisions. Bingo. So therefore, the effect, you can show people that the effect on that is that it changes. The exactly. And, and we'll, we'll, those outcomes are separate types of measures. We'll correlate, they're separate types of measures. We'll correlate behavior measures with outcome measures in a little <laughs> bit, and it'll, it'll make more sense to you. They're different, they're different kinds of measures. So remember that control chart we talked about a little bit ago, and I said there was two problems with it? Well, the, I'm about to talk about the second problem. Does anyone recognize this? Uh, Gaussian curve. <laughs> Gaussian curve. Yeah. So um, the idea here, this is this occurs in nature and 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 manufacturing processes a lot, um, but uh, people assume it occurs more often than it actually occurs. And in knowledge work, it's actually not the norm. Fat tails and black swans are much more the norm. So, so um. People talk about the one standard deviation and below, and that's what the, the control chart was using um, to, to make a choice. And that's about 85% of all the, the work items uh, it fell into that. And then there's two standard deviations if you want to be really stringent. Well, this is the normal curve, and this is a scatter chart of knowledge work, of stories. And this is the histogram of that data. Now, I chose one with a particularly fat tail, but this is pretty normal. This is pretty much the way this this data looks when you when you look at it in the histogram. Does this shape look like this shape? No. In fact, it's almost like the exact opposite. So if you make <coughs> calculations of what the percentile coverage is likely to be with the assumption that the shape of the curve is this, it's going to be wrong, right? It's not going to be the mean plus one standard deviation. It's going to get you 85% of the work items. Well, these techniques were developed in manufacturing where you just, you couldn't afford to measure every axle that came off the line. You just measured a sample of them, maybe one out of 10, maybe one out of 100, and you sort of looked for the drift off of the, the nominal size, and, and then you used statistics to sort of, sort of project what the whole sample size is and see if you had any ones that were out of tolerance. Well, that was a technique used in manufacturing. It's not a technique you should use here because it doesn't work because the stuff is the wrong shape. So, <laughs> yes? And, you know, this manufacturing moved away from it, too, because they now have lasers that can actually measure every single thing coming off the assembly line. So that's the difference also. We, we are measuring every point anyway. Why bother with, with using sampling techniques? I can count how many of these dots are below this line and tell you that 43% of them are below that line. I can count the next group and tell you that 68% of them are below that line. I don't need to sample and project the shape of the curve. I can actually calculate the exact shape of the curve because I have every measurement. I don't need to sample and do this. So this is the other innovation that, that the tip chart did. This is the one in particular that um, uh, David Anderson was, was pretty happy with because he was proposing the Schwartz method. I don't know, you, you sound pretty familiar with this. Uh, David was, was proposing the Schwartz method, and that was actually the worst one of, of the three. The, the technique um, that was in the that first one had a three to ten time um, error rate for, for um, calculating the risk, for instance, of a service level agreement. So if your company put aside um, $100,000 to cover the contingency that you're going to miss your service level agreement of, you know, I don't know, one out of every 2% of the time, right? But instead of 2% of the time you missed your service level agreement, you missed it 20% of the time, that $100,000 suddenly would have needed to be a million dollars to cover that, and you'd be out of, a, out of a job probably if you'd made a service level agreement commitment that way. Luckily, most people don't trust this stuff well enough to to put that much, that big of a bet on it. And so, so sin number um, six here is not working. I think it was six. 
Huh. It's bad analysis. And my clicker stopped working all of a sudden. Okay. It's bad analysis. Um, and this is this has the percentile coverage that fixes that. So there's a gentleman by the name of Troy McGinnis. And not Troy. Troy um, lives in Seattle, and um, he's another quant like me. Um, he, his company's name is Focused Objectives, and um, he's a, the guest author on my blog series on the Seven Deadly Sins. And he sin number seven is essentially from his material. So um, his name is his Twitter <coughs> feed is at the bottom here, and this is. This is all his material. When I gave this talk at the Adler Conference, um, I had him come up and give this part of the talk. And when he gives talks, he has me come up and give parts of his talks, too. So we're good buds. Um, so sin number seven is forecasting without discussing probability. Um, so there is no single forecasted result. There will all always be many possible results. Some are more likely than others. And back to this normal distribution, so the time to complete any given backlog item um, is going to you know, vary. There's a range of possible outcomes there, and it may or may not be a normal, a normal distribution. But if you always assume that the middle is going to happen, the, the mean of that probability is going to happen, then half the time you'll be wrong one way, and half the time you'll be wrong the other way. You'll never actually be exactly right. Now, of course, if you come in early, nobody minds, and if you come in late, everybody minds. But you're, so you're going to have piss people off half the time with this with this approach. Um, so that's not what you do. You typically, you know, buffer it, right? So, have any of you ever had these conversations? Your management, your your dev manager comes to you and he gives you a quote of four weeks to get something done, and, and you go, "Did you already put the engineering doubling on that, or do I need to double <laughs> it first before I double it again before I bring it to my?" Has anyone ever had one of those conversations? That's exactly how we how we work, right? So, um, so there's another there's another technique called Monte Carlo simulation. And in the interest of time, I'm going to breeze through these slides real quick. So, is is anyone familiar with um, know the name Nate Silver? You know Nate Silver. So, what's Nate Silver's claim to fame? Political predictions. Political predictions, right? Yeah. So. Baseball first, right? He, now he's back working for ESPN. He started off working in sports, then he went to poli politics. He, he founded a blog called 538.com. And on a whim, um, six years ago or so, he decided he was going to use the same techniques he'd been using to predict sports to predict the, the, the first election, the first Obama election. Who did he vote against there? Uh, McCain. McCain Palin, right? McCain Palin. And he predicted 49 of the 50 states correctly using this technique called Monte Carlo. Then four years later, he predicted all 50 of 50 states accurately. He got every single state. He was <coughs> down to the last electoral vote. He got it right. He predicted that. And he used this technique called Monte Carlo simulation. And so the idea here is you, you simulate randomness <laughs> in the process. And you pretend like various things happen and, and some of them will take longer than others. You might even add elements of risk. And, and these are all in the slides, and I can't click and get through them. So you might even add elements of risk um, in here, historical rate. And, and you, you calculate a probability of when the data, the project is likely to finish instead of a single, a single outcome. And using this technique called Monte Carlo, and you run the simulation thousands of times till you get a probability curve of when things are likely to come out. And you can even add in risk. So you can ask the team, um, what are the possible risks that could delay this? And you have them identify what's the likelihood that that risk will occur, and then how, how much of a delay will it add? And you know, in, in most cases, those risks are bigger drivers of the outcome than your actual forecast. You know, some bad thing happens, someone is not available, some vendor doesn't come through. Those are typically drive more variability. And at the beginning of the, of the project, you know, your 95% confidence in interval might be out there really far. And then you work really hard to mitigate these risks. And the, the biggest one and the one that's likely to lead the most delay, you, you, you lower the chance of it happening and the 95 confidence interval moves, moves to the left. And you mitigate the next one a little bit and you mitigate all of them eventually, and, and this is where the, 
this is where the final prediction will be. So you, the idea is to sort of keep running the simulation um, many times throughout the project, um, reevaluating the likelihood of a risk occurring. Maybe the risk already did occur, and, and it's already baked into the, into the delay you've already got right now. Okay, so this is the seven deadly sins, um, and this is the equivalent heavenly virtues. So you can take a picture of this, of this slide, and you'll have the whole thing. And I think you'll, um, I don't know, do we share yeah. these things? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you, Bob, you'll, you'll email them out. Hang out here for just a second, let you guys all get this down. Oh, go back. I'll go back. Sorry. I'll go back. What is note two, day one? Have one metric? That means from the get go. From the get go, make sure you have at least one metric from each block, that you're balanced. Um, so, um, data visualizations like photography impact as a function of perspective, illumination, and focus. Um, so when you look at this guy in closed form, it looks impossible to physically build. But if you just change your perspective a little bit, you realize it isn't what you thought it was, and it's, it's possible. So this is my art. Of, has anyone heard of the art of the possible? Is that a phrase you guys use? This is my art of the possible slide. So... Okay, so that's, that's, that's sort of the seven deadly sins of Agile measurement content.